Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to uh, the Complexity Institute and to the distinguished lectures of the Complexity Institute. Um, and we are most happy to kickstart this series of distinguished lectures with a very renowned scientist in complexity science um, who was already working on complexity way before we actually called it complexity, I think. And um, so he was, as an example, he was working on, on crowd dynamics when most of us were still trying to walk, uh, learning to walk, so to say. And he was, he was working on, on, on traffic dynamics when we were you know, still on our little bikes with support wheels. And uh, he was already thinking about you know, making these systems that makes our life complicated to make them you know, better and more intelligent. Taking into account not only sociology, um, psychology, but also you know, physics and mathematics. So um, it's a definitely a pleasure to introduce uh, Dirk Halving from ETH Zurich uh, to all of you. Um, he, um, oh, he's one of those guys that doesn't have to worry anymore about the citation index or something like that with a H index, which is way over 70, so he doesn't have to worry about that. <laughs> um, it's really a pleasure. I hope you all enjoy it. I know Derek is very eager to have discussions going on. He's, king, he's going to challenge us with uh, wild ideas, I would say, and some of them are not so wild and actually quite uh, you know, stimulating. So I really hope that we can have um, a discussion, a lively discussion going on during uh, or after, whatever, it's up to you, uh, this presentation. So join me in welcoming uh, Dirk Helling. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be back in Singapore, a wonderful city and country. And today I'm going to talk about building a smart digital society together. That means all of us. The problems of the world are complex. We are faced with climate change on a scale of, say, 30 to 50 years. Um, we are seeing it now already. We are faced with an energy crisis. We need to rebuild our system towards renewable energy. And in fact, uh, we'll run out of oil in a couple of decades. And uh, this will produce a number of dramatic problems, in particular as we are using oil not only to, uh, to drive our cars and fly planes, but also to produce fertilizers, uh, plastic, and many other things that have become so important for our lives. On the same order of time, we are seeing a digital revolution happen. So basically, computers are getting into this range where they will overtake the complexity of the human brain. And the question is, how is this going to change our society? We already see that parallel to this development, cybercrime is exploding exponentially. It's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Every year now, up to $3 trillion are being wasted through cybercrime. And maybe even more worrying is cyber war because basically within the fraction of a second, we could switch off critical infrastructures if not well enough protected. But in fact, we don't know how well our infrastructures are really protected. We've seen some manipulations of critical infrastructures all around the globe recently. Further on, there are challenges that could be even on a much smaller time scale, the financial system might potentially collapse. At least we didn't leave the financial crisis behind. And also conflict or war could happen anytime. So we need to be better prepared for these kind of situation. It's clear that certain challenges will come. And one of them could also be actually a global pandemic. Now, this is the more serious as our antibiotics are becoming less and less effective. So more and more uh, multi-resistant bacteria. And so basically, even those bacteria that we saw we could control might come back and uh, pose new risks. 
So the question, how can we address all these problems? Do they have something in common? Well, there is this old approach. We know it very well. That's what scientists used to do. We went to a library. We were trying to find the right kind of literature. We were reading a lot of books, get an overview. And then we identified the gaps in the knowledge. We employed uh, PhD students uh, to fill these gaps, and postdocs too, of course. And that took a few years. And then eventually, a gap was filled. And it produced even more books. So eventually, you know, after a couple of decades, that would even go into a regulation. And so basically, from the identification of a problem until the problem is fixed, it easily takes 30 years on average. And one of the reasons is that basically all the knowledge that we've learned some time back stands in the way of innovation. So Max Planck therefore said, science advances funeral by funeral. Well, well, what do we do in a time that's changing so quickly that we can't wait for these funerals any longer to make progress? That's a question that John Brockman was asking recently in a provocative way. And we're really in deep trouble because we need more speed, more capacity, more impact when it comes to producing new results. And so fortunately, there is a powerful method that uh, has been developed recently, which is evidence-based decision making using big data. We'll look into this a little bit more. Obviously, by now, the huge amount of data that are being collected every single second about what we are doing. So that was what we are writing on the web, what we are shopping, what, uh, where we are moving. All of these things are basically recorded. And this can be used in order to get a better idea of what is going on in our economy and society. And so basically, the expectations of decision makers are that you would get answers to your problems basically in a second. In the very same way as we Google to find out about something. So we enter our question, we'll get results. And then it may not be the perfect result, but uh, at least we can take some action. Within just 60 seconds of time, 700,000 search queries are being sent, and 500,000 Facebook posts. So this is a hell of a lot of data. And uh, it's no wonder that people are now saying, OK, Data is the new world. It's a resource that you can make money with. And if you look at uh, companies in the Silicon Valley, you can make a lot of money with it, billions of dollars. Even with open data, you can make uh, three to five trillions a year. And that's quite a lot. That means it's $700 per person per year extra. That's quite nice. Uh, so it's important that we make sure that we would get a piece of this cake, right? But for this, we need to learn how to drill and distill the data. And that's not so simple anymore. I'll address that in my other talk this afternoon. So let's spend a little bit of time on what you can do with big data. You can use it for good. You can craft new instruments to explore the world. Um, you can map the world in the first place. So you collect all the data. And if you do that well, then basically you can create a picture of the world. I'll come to this uh, in detail later on. And with all this information, you can create processes for decision makers. 
rather than just looking into a GDP per capita for a country with a delay of so and so many months, we could now get disaggregated data, we could get it at a finger snip. Uh, we could measure other things that are important, such as um, environmental conditions, uh, social capital, such as reputation and trust, which is a basis also for economic development, but also the happiness of people. All of these things now become measurable. We could understand the spreading of international tension, and we could also better prepare for the spreading of diseases such as Ebola. And so we are learning a lot about problems that uh, have been bothering us in the past. But also more positive things like innovation, the production of knowledge and the consumption of knowledge can now be measured. So we've been looking in citation data and you can basically see the flow of ideas from one country to another, from one city to another. And it's quite interesting to identify the most productive places in the world. You can also zoom into this and look at the spreading of ideas, of means, of physical concepts, for example. And this map has been automatically produced over here, showing the most important subjects in physics. And even though I studied physics, I should say, it was never so clear as it became when I saw this picture. When I looked at it, I said, yes, yes, this is what actually happened. And um, usually we, we have so much noise around this, so it is sometimes really difficult actually to see what is going on. So these things become measurable, and also we can map casual spreading. For example, we've been looking into birth death data of notable people over a time period of 2,000 years. You know, that's a long time ago. I would think, oh, probably there's not much information left about these times, but you would be surprised how much you can reconstruct from these birth death data alone. Now add all this other information that you still have about this time. You could do many more things. So we can see in the movies that you can find on YouTube how culture spread in Europe. You can also see how America was basically discovered culturally. Yeah. So you see people arriving at the East Coast and eventually they explore the entire country and end up at the West Coast. So this is pretty fascinating, and this is just the beginning of what we can do with all these cultural data. Now, given that you can do so many amazing things with data that is now becoming available, would we still need science? Sorry to say this, but <laughs> you're studying science. But there's Chris Anderson who said, there will be the end of theory. The data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. So if you just have enough data, he said, quantity turns into quality. And basically, machine learning algorithms will be able to identify everything that is important <coughs> automatically in these data. This is really true. Well, hopefully not, of course, otherwise you should better become a data analyst, right? Um, is big data a universal tool, as is sometimes claimed, to understand the world and govern it? Can we know everything in principle? Certainly, we, we're measuring more and more data about the world and in perspective, you know, perhaps we could have the perfect measurement of the entire world. What would be the implications of this? Could we create 
a crystal ball could we see everything in the world in real time as it happens and maybe even predict the future well if we wanted to do this certainly we needed to make sure that the course of the world stays predictable and that's why we would need to be able to influence it and so first of all we would have to figure out how the world should evolve we would probably use huge computers in order to optimize the state of the world to try to do this and with this the question is could we act like a wise king could we find the perfect decisions and put them into practice well in order to put them into practice we would also have to be powerful we would have to be able to influence people to do the right thing yeah if selfishness was bad for the evolution of the system we would have to make them less selfish for example and well if it's really true that knowledge is power then knowing everything would make whoever has all this information would make him basically almighty right i mean it, it's kind of a technocratic vision and some people would say okay this is a technological implementation of, of god yeah it's provocative yeah, but I think it's very important that we go through this argument to realize what's possible and what's not, or what's desirable and what's not. So for this to happen, we would need to be able to manipulate people's decisions. And that could be done with information. In fact, I mean, this is happening to a certain extent already. All the personalized advertisement that you see while you browse the web is trying to make you do a certain kind of things. So is this perfectionizable? Well, it will stay a dream, I would say, for a number of reasons. The big data and the crucible approach are certainly powerful, but they do have some problems too. And one of the problems is that we find correlations in the data, patterns. But these patterns don't always need to have a causal meaning. We don't have to say, you know, if we do this, then that will happen. For example, uh, we see patterns in the sky, although most likely that they don't have a real meaning. And let's take, for example, this graph over here. It's showing a spurious correlation. Yeah? So if you show the number of zero killers as a function of chocolate consumption, yeah, it would be very dangerous to live in Switzerland. Unfortunately, uh, this is just a spurious correlation. So I don't need to be afraid. But the problem is that we might find such kind of correlations and patterns and we might think they're important and maybe they're not and of course no matter how much data you have there's still this problem that you need to, to distinguish different cases say good risks and bad risks and usually you don't have a clear separation of these cases So there's an overlap of the data points. And it's hard to say, is somebody really a terrorist or not? And uh, for that reason, there will be mistakes in the classification. Mistakes of first and second kind. That means uh, there will be wrong, false alarms, where we choose somebody to have bad intentions while this is not the case. And there are other cases where somebody has bad intentions and we wouldn't notice until it happens. As we've seen in Paris, of course. Mm. 
Now, such classification errors would happen also in other contexts, like uh, insurance contracts, or if banks uh, give a loan to you or not and have to decide uh, what interest rate you should pay. And so there would be lucky people who just get a better condition than they should get, and other people who get bad conditions, although they should get a better one. So there, there will be discrimination. And the more data we have, the more dimensions we distinguish, potentially more discrimination will we have. So we need to think about it. And there's a third source of errors, which is we could choose the wrong kind of model. Yeah. Maybe a linear model is not the right thing to choose. So what kind of model should we choose? Um, even more obvious is the situation for the choice of a goal function. If you want to optimize the system, assume you have a powerful enough computer to do this. But for an optimization, you always need to have a goal function. What is it that you're going to optimize? And it's not so clear what would be the right goal function. Maximize money, maximize survivability, maximize satisfaction. What is it? So, you know, if um, there is this one decision maker, this wise king, you know, he would have to make up his mind. What is it that I'm going to optimize? And maybe the problem is to decide for one goal. Maybe it's better if there are many different institutions that have at least slightly different goals. And we'll come back to this later on. So, no doubt, big data allows for evidence-based decision making and big improvements, but it's not the ultimate solution. We also see that over here, there is another problem. And this relates actually to Moore's law. So as you can see in the blue curve, the processing power increases exponentially, doubles every 18 months approximately. But the data volume increases even faster. It doubles every 12 months. That's the green curve. So what's happening is we're getting from an age where we didn't have enough data to take good decisions towards an age where we can make evidence-based decisions using big data. But as you can see over here, there is a gap between the data volume and the processing volume. And that gap becomes larger and larger. In fact, the proportion of data that you can process is increasing, uh, decreasing more and more over time. That means there's a decreasing percentage of data that you can even look at. And that means the large majority of data eventually, in perspective, will be dark data. It's somewhere, but you cannot process it. And then you have to decide, okay, what kind of data am I going to process? And that creates what I call the flashlight effect. You could put the spotlight on basically anything you're interested in, but you wouldn't see the stuff around it. And that means you pay too much attention to certain things while you overlook other things. And this is not a theoretical effect because most people haven't seen the financial crisis coming, yeah. despite big data. That was already there at that time in America. They didn't, didn't see the Arab Spring coming. They didn't see the crisis in Ukraine coming. And also, the response to Ebola was much late. Yeah, it was more than in the last moment. So this is the problem. While we are paying attention to one challenge, we tend to overlook other challenges that are already emerging. 
But things are more serious in this season because systemic complexity at the red curve is increasing even faster. And that means that not even all the data and all the processing power in the world will allow you to keep control or to optimize the system in real time. That's kind of paradoxical. You would think that the more computer power you have, the more should you be able to uh, gain control. But the opposite is the case, and the reason is that we go on networking the world. Yeah? So that creates ever more possibilities and ever more complexity in a factorial way. And the question is, how can we deal with this? Fortunately, there is complexity time. Yes. And it allows us to understand the kinds of problems we are facing. First of all, just for the sake of completeness, I'm mentioning that we need to distinguish complicated and complex systems. So complicated systems like cars, you know, they consist of many parts, but these parts are in a certain position and serve a certain function. They're well controllable altogether. The few degrees of freedom. So with the steering wheel and the gas and the brake, you can basically control the entire system. In contrast, Traffic flow is a complex dynamical system where each of the parts, in this case, each driver vehicle unit can separately adjust to other parts in the system. And it creates a collective dynamics that may not be understandable from the properties of the single parts. The interactions are becoming the dominant force basically of uh, determining the system behavior. And so one of the problems that cause trouble in the real world is unstable dynamics. Uh, we probably know it best from weather forecasts. <coughs> there are principal limits of predictability. Even if we had a weather station every single centimeter, as much data as you want, it would not be possible to predict the weather over a time period of a month or a year or five years. Why? Because the physics behind this, which is the physics of turbulence, doesn't allow this to happen. According to the physics of turbulence, it's similar in a certain sense uh, to determinist, deterministic chaos. It's slightest change in the initial condition would after some time lead to completely different outcomes, known as butterfly effect. And so there is another problem, like uh, control of these systems is difficult. For example, this is a predator prey system, and say the hunter would like to get the system towards this point. Well, if you try to do this, then most likely the system is going to end up in a completely different place. Or take this system, of course, well known to you, uh, first order phase transition at a tipping point. But the issue is that if you want to control a system, like a company or an economy or a society, then in many cases, there's not much happening. Yeah? You're making an attempt, you have the best intentions, but it, the system doesn't do what you want it to do. system cannot be controlled like a bus. So you're putting more force in the system. You're trying harder, and still maybe nothing happens, or not to the extent that it should. And then you're trying even harder, and suddenly the system changes abruptly, but not always in the way that you want it to change. So that means managing complex systems is really difficult. 
as this example shows. So people are driving in a circle, and that shouldn't be a difficult task. Yeah? Everyone has a good driver education, sees what's going on, but still, a fencing traffic jam is occurring. So why is this? Well, if you would ask the drivers, they would probably say, there was a stupid driver in front of me who didn't uh, know how to drive a car. Uh, but of course, you know well that there are mathematical equations describing these kind of phenomena. And basically, these equations say, if the density is above a certain critical density, that means the distances between cars get smaller than a certain amount, then the traffic flow will be unstable. That means the slightest variation in the speed of a car will cause a ripple effect. The next driver will have to respond to this, but that happens with a delay. And in order to compensate for the delay, this driver has to brake a little bit harder. And the next one, even harder. So there is an amplification effect and a chain reaction and domino effect, you could say. And as a result, in the end, the cars get to stop, although no driver wants this to happen. Now, unfortunately, this is not the only unstable complex dynamical system that we know. What worries here is that if you're facing a complex dynamical system that is unstable, then no matter how hard you try, no matter how good your technology almost, uh, how much information you have, this system is likely to get out of control sooner or later with some restrictions. If you cannot push the system into a stable parameter, uh, that can sometimes be done with technology. Here's another example. So normally, pedestrians self-organize. You can see these lanes of uniform walking direction. And that produces actually pretty efficient flows. And little friction in the system. It's interesting. Of course, it doesn't take a policeman or any traffic signs or any laws. It's just happening automatically. However, if the density is too high, then again the system might get out of control and in fact a crowd disaster might happen. As unfortunately, we've seen that many times in the past. So even if, if all these people in the crowd are peaceful, not aggressive at all in their intentions, the situation might totally get out of control. People might die. Now, the situation is even more complicated in networks. Because one single event could trigger certain other events. Moreover, one event not only can trigger several events, but uh, the same event could be triggered by different causes. And there are delays also. So in many cases, it's difficult really to identify the cause effect relationship. Most of these processes are probabilistic on top of this. So they might sometimes happen and sometimes they don't happen. That really makes it difficult to identify the likely outcomes. Moreover, you could see that actually you know, one event triggers three events and uh, these events again trigger more than one event. So it's not just a domino effect, it's actually a cascade effect that becomes more and more serious the more it spreads. And unfortunately, the financial crisis seems to be of this kind. Here, the cascade effect hasn't stopped yet. In these kind of systems, a single local perturbation could mess up your entire system.
And this is just an experiment, right, for a rainy weekend. So <laughs> take mouse traps and some table tennis balls, and then you can do this uh, nice experiment. Now, this experiment has been invented to represent chain reactions as we see them in nuclear fission. And we know nuclear fission is a process that can be controlled. Otherwise, then we wouldn't have nuclear power stations. But it's difficult to control these processes. And sometimes, as we've seen in Fukushima and elsewhere, these processes can get out of control. Now, what if we have similar processes in economic and social systems, just in a much small, uh, slower scale? So it do doesn't look like an explosion as this does. But in fact, it might be similarly difficult to control. And in fact, I personally believe these kind of processes exist, and uh, a political revolution could be such a thing. So we certainly don't want such a thing to happen. But in order to avoid these things from happening, we need to understand them better. Here is a real life example. Bankruptcy is a bank of the United States after the failure of Lehman Brothers. So what you can see over here, hundreds of banks have failed, causing hundreds of billions of losses. And uh, this looks very similar to the experiment we've seen before. Hopefully, this is not an experiment. And again, a similar example is that of uh, blackouts of power grids. And believe it or not, in 2006, there was an example where a ship had to be transferred and the power line had to be turned off for some time. That was simulated before. But then there was a spontaneous failure of another line. And that together triggered a cascade of events within seconds. Uh, many power stations were taken off the net. And eventually, we had blackouts all over Europe, thousands of kilometers away. Uh, how can such a thing happen? And why is it that you know here there's still light, and here and here and here there is a blackout? It's a very difficult pattern to understand. But here is a computer simulation. There's a failure here in the beginning, and then it spreads. But still, here in the neighborhood, there is light. The largest damage is actually caused over here, yeah? far away 